Well, good evening, everybody, and welcome to this edition to the uh, Waypoint 55 webinar. Uh, it's hard to believe, but we have been doing these for six years, and uh, we just look at them as kind of a shot in the arm uh, to give a, just a practical uh, ministry strategy or teaching uh, that pastors and uh, members of churches and leaders of churches can implement to help your church get on mission and stay on mission. Uh, my name is Neil Wheeler. If you don't know me, I'm the director of leader care with Waypoint Church Partners. And uh, we exist at Waypoint just simply to, to catalyze kingdom growth. We've been around since 1938. And uh, since then, we've uh, catalyzed kingdom growth in, in two ways. One by uh, planting new churches. Uh, we just planted our 161st uh, church uh, during that period of time, and that's exciting, always exciting uh, to be planting churches. Uh, and uh, we also, though, in addition to planting new churches, uh, we love to partner with established churches uh, just to uh, help those churches get on mission, stay on mission, as I said uh, a few minutes ago. There are 505 uh, Christian churches, churches. Church of Christ in the Mid-Atlantic region of Virginia, uh, North and South Carolina, Maryland, Southern West Virginia, Upper East Tennessee. Uh, and so we just love building in uh, to those uh, churches. The reason we do that is we just have as a deep desire, just a deep vision that drives everything that we do at Waypoint. We just want to see an ever-increasing number of thriving leaders and churches. You see, what we know is that if leaders and the church are thriving, the church is going to thrive. And if the church is thriving, lost people are going to come to know Jesus. And so we do all that we do in ministry to catalyze kingdom growth because we want your church and we want you as a church leader to, to thrive. There are uh, uh, two or three things happening right now that I want to share with you uh, that you might uh, be interested in uh, becoming a, a part of. Uh, what I want to talk about uh, uh, quite uh, simply are uh, three different events that are taking place uh, 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 this week, next week, and then uh, down in, in April. Uh, on our website, waypointchurchpartners.com, you can get information about our Art of the Sermon events. Uh, we're right in the middle of that season, had one great Art of the Sermon up in Frederick, Maryland last week, uh, had one event yesterday, I, I'm sorry, today in Great Tennessee, another uh, tomorrow here where I am in Burlington, North Carolina, and then in a few weeks in uh, uh, April, uh, we'll wind that up in, uh, in Richmond. And those are just focused on helping communicators learn how from great communicators, learn how to do uh, their craft better. Uh, something else I want to just pass on to you, if you're not aware, we have two different podcasts and they are, you get crazy, crazy uh, listeners uh, to both of those. One, the Waypoint uh, Leadership Podcast, and the other uh, is the Waypoint uh, Pastors Wives Podcast. And both of those are excellent. And we just would encourage you uh, to uh, hook up with those if you have not already. Uh, by the way, just lastly, want to let you know that all of our webinars, uh, all six years of them, are uh, listed on our uh, Waypoint Church Partners YouTube uh, page. And you can go there and uh, you can search them by, by topic uh, and you'll find things all the way from church security and safety to how to have a great uh, greeter ministry to uh, missions how to support your missionaries better, to prayer and uh, uh, leader care and multiple other types of subjects. So uh, that's, I just want to uh, share those things with you. One last thing before we get started, just want to uh, remind you that at the bottom of your page uh, of your screen, uh, you should find a Q&A button. And as we're talking, uh, go ahead and uh, click that Q&A button and ask a question. And we will uh, try to get your questions and figure out, uh, uh, try to figure out some answers uh, for you. Tonight, I'm really, really excited uh, because, uh, I, as many of you know, I am very passionate about how to empower your church 
uh, through prayer. And I'm really excited tonight uh, to talk with you and to have a couple buddies of mine on uh, to talk about two initiatives that can change the spiritual climate in your church. I, I would go beyond that to say these are two initiatives that not just can change, but will change the spiritual climate in your church. Of course, what I'm talking about uh, is uh, uh, having a period of 21 days of prayer and or prayer and fasting. Uh, and I am happy to be joined tonight by uh, two old, old friends. Uh, uh, we've known each other. Uh, I've known these guys for 20 plus years. Uh, and uh, Ryan Atchison, uh, I'll get the, them to uh, talk about themselves here in just a minute, uh, is an old buddy of mine. I first met Ryan. Uh, he was working at Panera and working a little, a little small church at the time. And now he's at uh, the chapel in Midlothian, a great church in, uh, in Midlothian. In fact, chapel, RVA, multiple campuses. Uh, and then my other friend with us tonight is Sean Geis. And I knew Sean back. <laughs> Before he was a Christian, uh, he was he was a he was always a friendly sinner, but he was a sinner. I just that just a deal. Uh, oh, was, but I knew him way back then uh, before a mutual <clears throat> friend of ours began discipling him uh, and what that would look like for him to follow Jesus as a disciple of Jesus. And, and now uh, Sean uh, works at Journey Christian Church. Uh, in Midlow, Virginia as well. By the way, these two churches are the two largest churches in Midlow, my uh, corner of Richmond, Virginia. And it's fascinating to me that both of them uh, have started the last couple or three years or more uh, starting their year uh, with a season of prayer or fasting and or fasting together, both of them. So I, I just uh, want to give you ch guys a chance to introduce yourself just a little bit. Uh, uh, Ryan, tell us about your role at Chapel and uh, and tell us why you're a good fit for it. Well, thanks. Thanks for having me on, Neil. Um, I think, well, my role at Chapel is I'm a first impressions or hospitality um, guy. <laughs> we're, we're not huge on titles or our um you know flow charts or things like that around here but I, I take care of our hospitality ministry um and and i just i just love it i think i think uh after being a senior pastor for 15 years um and and uh really just trying to grow a church and and doing all the work and doing all the things uh, it's nice to it's nice to not be the buck stop <laughs> it's nice to to not be the person that has to uh, make it make and own all of the decisions. Um, I like having a lane to run in, and and I think why why it's the best fit for me is because I'm a I'm a pastor. I'm a shepherd pastor. Um, I like to be with people, and um, you know I have over 300 volunteers uh, in my um, circle of of influence, and um, have built a leadership structure in that and training and, and all the things. And I, I love just having an area to run in. Uh, and I also love serving a visionary leader like our pastor, Pastor Brandon Samuel, um, who I've known for over 25 years. We actually went to Bible college together. Um, so it, it feels like feels like coming home um, to be here with him. Uh, you know, he has the same DNA um, that I have. And um, it just it's just been a, a wonderful fit. I've loved uh, doing ministry here for the last uh, two and a half years and can't wait to see what God does next. Well, Ryan, you and I have talked about uh, in the past uh, that you and I are similar in that we're both pastors at heart. We just yeah. love pastoring, shepherding people. Uh, and maybe that's why uh, we struck up a great friendship back years ago. Uh, and, and that's wonderful. Uh, well, Sean, tell us about uh, your role at, at Journey and why you're just a good fit for that. Yes, I am. Uh, I am the groups or small groups or community groups, whatever you want to call it, uh, coach. And what I do at Journey is I help people get to groups, whether it's a um, a married group, couples group, a mixed group, a singles group, men or women's. I try to, uh, we believe that um, 
relationships are formed uh, in a powerful way in groups in our church. And it's a high priority for us to, to move people from the big church into the small circles of uh, community where we believe that life really uh, grows and takes off in the Lord. So my job is to get people into those groups, to set those groups up, to, uh, to help leaders get formed uh, that think they want to be leaders or they know they're leaders and what best fits them, and then spread that out in locations across the county, literally, um, so that we can have those groups uh, in different areas that's more convenient to the people in uh, those areas. Well, Sean, I've uh, often talked about uh, you, uh, Ryan, I've talked about you as well, but Sean, I've talked about you and uh, I've talked about your Bible. uh, And I said, uh, this dude, when he was being discipled, he was taught by a guy that taught him how to underline and highlight and write. Because there, I've, I've looked over your shoulder and there's not a page in your Bible that you have not written or <laughs> underlined something. And uh, certainly uh, the Lord's spirit has changed your heart uh, through his word. And I'm just thrilled to see uh, what God's done in your life and what he's doing, continuing to do. Well, guys, when I uh, uh, attend a church, visit a church, and I'm in 40 different churches a year in my role, uh, and uh, but when I, whenever I attend a church, I always ask two questions. I evaluate with two questions. The first question is, do I feel welcome here today? Do I feel welcome? But the second question, I think it's far more important, is do I get a sense that the Lord feels welcome here today? And I think both of those questions are critical and they're interconnected, really. And they're critical because I believe they go uh, to the very two greatest needs that every person has when they come into a new church. And that is, will people just accept me? You know, they may be sinful, and they are, we all are, and they have all kind of baggage but the question is, would somebody just accept me? Uh, and uh, But then the other question that they're asking, uh, and th- they're saying, you know, uh, if I wanted to meet God, one would think I ought to be able to go to church and find him there. And they're asking that question. Can I meet God here today? Guys, I talk about y'all's church, churches all the time. Uh, a, a lot of, to a lot of different people. I have a lot of churches that I talk about, but y'all, y'all's uh, churches are are two that I talk about, especially especially in regard to a person's drive up and walk in experience when they get to your place. Uh, Sean, tell us about uh, y'all's part. Yeah, y- y- tell us about your church building first of all. Uh, tell us what that's like. Well, we're a uh, large building. Uh, most people are familiar with Costco buildings. We used to be an old Costco building, and um, uh, we've renovated it to a to a large uh, building that uh, people come into our parking lot, and that's where we know that they're going to get their first impression of our church. They're, they'll see the signs, or or they've been invited, and and so we believe that where they meet, where they come into our church. The first experience they're going to have is parking. So we try our best. We have a parking team that's made up of men and women who are out there to greet people with a smile and welcome them to our church. Because also we know that when people come to church, they are coming looking for hope. There's something in them, two things I think that takes place for people to come to church. One is they're looking for something special inside, something's probably drawing them to that church. Mm-hmm. And second, like you said, was, are they going to be welcome there? And is it a fit? And and we know that the adversary is already attacking that spirit of, let's make this tough on you. I don't want you to go inside that church. So we try to take that adversary and place him on the side and 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 having a welcoming spirit and ready to greet you and we've prayed over that before you even arrived and and a pray for the circumstances that's going to bring you there so we want you to have a really good experience from the minute you drive up and then when you come into the building 
we want to welcome you and make you feel comfortable and know that no matter who you are, you're welcome here and that God does welcome you and that you do meet God there. That is that is our priority too. Not that you uh, not only meet someone that you can place a name with a face, but most importantly, that, that you feel the spirit of God at work in that church and on you and that you are there for the right purpose. Sean, because uh, Journey is the closest Christian church to uh, our house, just a mile away, uh, I, I invite people all the time to uh, to attend. And I was uh, talking to the uh, gal, young gal that cuts my hair, and uh, uh, just down the street from the church, and uh, she's got uh, two or three tattoos that I can see, and two or three body piercings that I can see. And I don't know if she's got more or not. Anyway, uh, I was telling her, I've talked to her, I said, You got to go to Journey. You just got to go to Journey. And I said, You're going to drive up in the parking lot. And before you get inside, I guarantee you, I'd lay money on it that they're, you're going to be greeted five different by five different people when, when in the parking lot. And I said, it doesn't matter, rain or shine. I've been there while it's raining and they're out there when it's raining. I said, you go walk in a door, you're going to be thrilled. Your daughter, little five-year-old daughter is going to be greeted into the uh, children's area and she's going to be thrilled. And when you're going to love the music, you're going to love everything about preaching. Uh, and the greatest thing is you're, you when you pick up your daughter after children's church, She's going to say to you, mommy, can we come back next week? And you're going to be hooked. And, and so I don't know if she's come yet, but uh, I, I know she will. I'm praying for her. Uh, well, Ryan, your place at chapel equally is such a positive experience before you ever get inside the building. Describe that to us. Well, we, we try to, you know, set the atmosphere. We have um, kind of a speaker system that goes all over our building and, and even out into the parking lot. Uh, so we have some upbeat uh, music happening. We've got a, a parking team out there. They've got the, the lightsabers, you know, like Luke Skywalker waving people where to go and uh, rain or shine, they're out there. Uh, we're in the middle of a, of, of a building project. A, a funny thing with Sean and I in the same call is, is that we're, our building is actually Journey's old building. We moved into their building when they moved over to Costco uh, and so we've seen tremendous growth here, just like they did. Um, and um, and so we're in the middle of a building project. We've got a, a construction site. Our half of our parking lots are are dirt slash mud, <laughs> depending on what the weather's like out. And uh, our guys, our parking teams out there, uh, all you know, waving people around, showing people where to park and. Um, you know, our, our hospitality team will go out with umbrellas and walk people in the door and, and, um, uh, you know, just trying to go that extra mile to make people feel, um, seen, make them feel welcome, make them feel loved. Um, one of my favorite authors, uh, Henry Nowen talks about ministry as creating space. Mm -hmm. Um, so I'm always telling our hospitality team is, is that we help to create the space not so that the church can change our life, but so that God can change our life. And so when people aren't worried about what's going on with their kids, when they're not worried about, you know, what they're going to put in their hand, we've got a coffee team that makes coffee. When they're not worried about where they're going to sit, um, it can create some space so that God can really speak to them and their lives can be uh, transformed. And so that's our that's our, our prayer uh, week in and week out is, is just trying to make room for God to blow some people's lives up in the best possible way. That That is so good. Both of you guys have described that interconnection between uh, the importance of greeting people properly and greeting the Lord properly. Because as, uh, as the Lord intersects with the efforts to greet people then he has the space to be able to work. And I love, Ryan, what you just said. That is so, so powerful and strong. You are right on that. Well, you both uh, in your churches uh, uh, have been starting uh, in January, starting the year uh, in January with uh, a season of, of prayer and or a season of fasting. Uh, Sean, I'll let you go first. Why don't you describe for us uh, a journey uh, what the season of uh, prayer fasting looks like in January. Well, we've uh, been doing this for a few years. And the reason behind it is we believe that uh, at the first of the year, we try to dedicate um, 
our lives to God, the church to God. We believe that, uh, you know, I've always said that humility is the uh, secret sauce to the Christian walk. Um, and it's a time, not only as an individual, but as a church, that we would humble ourselves before God. And that we believe that, um, you know, I, I, will, I will quote uh, John 15, 5, if I may. Um, I am the vine, you are the branches. If you remain in me and I in you, you will bear much fruit. And apart from me, you can do nothing. And that last part, apart from me, you can do nothing. So we set up our the beginning of our year with prayer fasting, with the humility before God, the understanding that apart from God, we can do nothing. And so it's a time where we as individual and as a body, we, we start aligning ourselves with God and what does he want, not what do we want? What is he going to do in this church, not what are we going to do in this church? And then also we, we find ourselves getting unity. And what it does, it prepares our, our heart, our soul, our thoughts, our mind, God first. And then lead us, Lord, where you will the rest of this year. And everything that we do, let it be about you. And may we invite you in first to this, this body and this individuals. And so as a, we come together and we just believe it's a special time. And it's proven to be a special time where we just bring everything before the Lord and humble, us, humble ourselves as, as, a, as a church. That is uh, that is so 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 strong and uh, uh, well well Ryan uh, y'all have a very fascinating uh, twenty one days of prayer describe that uh, our twenty one days of prayer we do um, every day uh, for the first well we start on the first whatever the first Sunday is of the of the new year um, and then we go for twenty one days after that. Um, and we do every morning, Monday through Friday, 7 a.m. Um, in our sanctuary. Uh, Saturdays, uh, we do 9 a.m. And um, we have uh, live worship, um, a devotional time, a personal prayer time, and then a corporate prayer time. So we kind of roll all that into an hour uh, block. And, and um, it really it really creates a, um, I don't know, uh, power. Uh, it's like a, a battery charger, you know, for, for the whole year. It's the, it's the principle of first, you know, it's first fruits. It's, it's giving God an offering of the first part of your year. Um, saying, God, I want to, I want to hear you. I want to follow you. Uh, I want you to, this is your church. We're going to, we're going to do what you say. Uh, here we are, Lord, we're listening. Um, go ahead and go ahead and speak. And so that format that we use really, uh, it works well. People know that they're going to be out at eight o'clock so that they can get to work or get to school. Um, and it's, um, it's a great opportunity to have a, a bunch of different people, our staff people and our, our leaders here in the church to, to have an opportunity to speak to the whole church uh, with that devotional time, um, we'll utilize uh, all different people, um, even some of our young people, to lead those devotions. Um, and it, I don't know, it, it, we just got it so that it works. And it's all trial and error, Neil. <laughs> we, we tried a whole bunch of different things when um, I wasn't here when they first started it, but Pastor Brandon and Pastor Joel were here and it was pretty much, you know, four people in a room praying, just like you, you would think it was when you call for a prayer meeting. And now we have, um, you know, most mornings we'll have 500 um, or so people on Saturdays. We'll have upwards of 800 people show up um, to come and just pray. I mean, there's, there's really not a whole lot happening other than, than prayer. We have 20 minutes where people are doing nothing but just praying, you know, nobody's juggling or, or, uh, you know, sometimes, sometimes we do feed the students donuts, but, uh, you know, uh, we'll have, we'll have 50, um, high school students here, uh, at 7 a.m. Monday through Friday for all 21 days. Uh, just leading the worship up front, um, praying, uh, praying together in small groups. It's it's uh, it's amazing. <laughs> I've had the opportunity to experience uh, 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 both of your 
uh, churches initiatives uh, for prayer and prayer and fasting. Uh, and uh, it is, uh, it, it, as I uh, observe both, uh, and my boss, Tim, said, hey, do you have, Neil, I always like to get you to do a couple of prayer webinars. Uh, do you have anything in mind? I said, as a matter of fact, I'm about ready to bust. I, I can't wait to uh, have a couple of my buddies to come and share about uh, uh, prayer and fasting ministry in their church. Fascinating thing is, neither one of y'all are the prayer chairman uh, of your of your church's prayer ministry uh and uh uh and that is uh that is uh you know it, it's an amazing thing to be able to talk with those people and see their vision and heart for prayer uh but it's uh, uh really cool uh, yeah Ryan I remember one morning I, I was able to go several times uh during uh, this January's 21 days uh at your church and I remember one morning and you mentioned I'm not sure if people caught it uh there will be 50 teenagers 50 kids up front on up front at the stage uh during the worship time and they got a, a staff has to kind of bust them up and say y'all got to move back so that people can get up the stage <laughs> and uh but th there are uh on the stage, there are cards that people can write prayer requests on or mm -hmm. prayers on and put them there. I, I noticed people would pick those up and they'd pray over them and then walk and pray over them. But one of the most moving things I I, I, I remember uh, that there was a, a young man, I, I don't I don't really call his name. And of course, never, I don't think I'd ever seen him before. Uh, but I think Pastor uh, Joel uh, had tapped him and said, could you close, help us close out with corporate prayer this morning? And he went up and I tell you, I've heard, a, I've heard a lot of prayers and y'all have too. And I've, I've prayed a lot of prayers and y'all have too, but I don't know that I've ever heard more heartfelt uh, prayer from a, from a young junior high age boy, uh, mm -hmm. not afraid of praying in front of, 450 500 people because he just he just wanted to talk to his father and uh he was doing that and that was uh that was awesome that was just so awesome well tell me about uh this i mean we could go on a long long time describing uh the initiatives and and by the way i, I do want to say to people right up front you do not not have to be a church of over a thousand uh, to have an effective prayer uh, uh, and, and fasting uh, time. I, I'm going to be on a, a conference call on Thursday night with a small church of less than 100. Uh, and they're leading into Easter with 40 days of prayer. And they're, they're doing that by uh, uh, doing conference calls every night. And I'm going to have a chance to just speak into them for a few minutes on Thursday night. Uh, I, I've heard other churches in other different ways uh, have, uh, you know, 21 days of prayer or fasting. And uh, so you don't have to be a huge church uh, to do that. Any size church can pray. Uh, but it takes somebody that'll say, let's figure this out and let's move forward uh, with that. Well, I, I'd like for you to really, and, and you all already told us what your areas of emphasis is in your church. But I'd like to uh, ask you now is how has 21 days of prayer and fasting impacted your area of ministry in your church? Ryan, I'll let you go first. In first impressions, how is How's prayer and fasting, uh, how's prayer impacted that area of ministry? Well, I think it's, you know, it's that old, <clears throat> it's that old preacher story, you know, when you have a, a husband and wife and the closer that they get to the Lord, the closer they come together, you know, you know, that, that old story. Uh, I think it's the same thing here is, is when we get closer to the Lord, our hearts are more open to the lost. Our hearts are more open to um, the people that are walking into our door. Um, a couple of weeks ago, just a couple of weeks ago, we had um, we had a young a young man um, show up at church after our four thirty service. You know, it's six o'clock at night. We've done four services. We're all we're all beat, and he comes after church, um, and he uh, he rides his bike uh, right into the lobby of the church, um, and he's. Uh, you know, a different, different kind of guy. Um, and, um, 
and he said, uh, Dad, I have these questions about God. And his father said, told him, I don't have any answers for you. He didn't, he didn't know anything about God. Um, and so the kid told his dad, I'm going to go to that church around the corner. And his father told him, they won't talk to you. You know, you're not, you're not like them. Uh, they, w- they won't give you the time of day. And um, a couple of people from our team spent over two hours with that young man. Um, just talking to him about the Lord and praying for him. And he's been back at our, now he showed, managed to show up at 430 for the 430 service. He still rides his bike into the lobby and parks it uh, in the lobby, but we don't care. <laughs> you know, here's a, here's a young guy who needs the Lord. And I, I feel like having our hearts tuned that way to the heart of the father helps us to love people so much better than if we were just loving them in our own strength. It's a, it's a, the closer we get to God, the more we love the things that God loves and God loves people and hospitality and first impressions is all about people. And so that's what we want to be and what we want to do. We want to be with the Lord um, so that we can be with the people that the Lord loves. Wow. That is, that is, that's so strong. Ryan, I, uh, uh, a couple years ago, I was asked to do a, uh, webinar about uh, how to do pastoral ministry today, one another ministry. And I, I started studying on all of the compassion uh, texts in the in the Bible. All the time the word compassion is used. Yeah. In the Old Testament, most all of them refer to God, but not all of them. 88, 85% of them do uh, talk about God's compassion. And the, in the Gospels, of course, they all talk about Jesus' compassion and the epistles all are encouragements to us to have the compassion that Jesus had. And that's what you're talking about. Uh, yeah. As the closer you to get to the Father, the more of his fruit, the more of his character, his nature just rubs off on you as the church. And so, yeah, the great point, great, great point. And uh, yeah, sa- sadly, uh, the dad had to say, don't go to that church around the corner. They won't accept you. But yep. here's a church that will. Uh, and uh, I'm glad that y'all are that kind of church. Now, Sean, uh, talk, uh, talk to us about small groups and and plugging people in there and, and how uh, prayer fasting impacts uh, that area, your area of ministry. Well, we're, um, since we come off the initiative uh a couple of years ago for, uh, on prayer and fasting, we, we've seen an increase in our uh, groups. We've, uh, matter of fact, we're getting ready to launch 50 groups this year uh, total. It will make 50 as we're, we're getting to add 10 more to our 40, which is going to place about 400 people in our community groups. And, um, and, and what we're seeing is, is this humbling that I talked about earlier that, that the reliance upon God and us relying upon God and what he's doing is, we're starting to see those fruits being borne out through changed lives, um, through people. I, I could just sit here and fill your ears with stories of um, uh, people that are that are coming to the church, getting invested into the, the community groups and starting to feel comfortable there and sharing their, their life story, hearing the stories of other people. And, and that starts to break down those walls of tension that they have. Is it, is it safe to share in here? And so we're starting to see that. And we're, we're, we've, we're uh, continuing baptizing people almost every Sunday now that comes from this, from, from, the, uh, um, from just the conviction of the Holy Spirit on their lives. And uh, I think the, the greatest, uh, Ryan said it in his statement, was we're seeing the loss come to life and through our community groups. And it's just every week we're seeing this worked out in some way, in some fashion, we're seeing people walk out of terrible backgrounds. Like I came out of uh, walking so far from God and, and walking towards God now. And it's just beautiful to see. So I would say the greatest thing that I could testify to is I'm seeing dead people now alive uh, in their faith. And that, that is worth everything that we put into it and where we're heading. And, and as long as we're seeing those kind of fruits, we know that we're, uh, we're on the right track. Jesus. Well, you know, 
uh, Sean, you are a living testimony to the fact that human argument could not argue you into the kingdom. Amen. Uh, <laughs> you know, and uh, uh, because because a lot of people tried, including me, you know, yeah. and uh, <laughs> but uh, I tried lovingly to do that, but nonetheless, <laughs> I, I was trying to uh, move you that direct. But the truth about what you're talking about, uh, the element of humility that comes out of prayer and fasting causes you to realize it. I can't do this. It's not about me doing this. It's about uh, the Holy Spirit doing it through his word, you know, as we're in his word and, and Bible study and small group uh, and, and God's word changes people. And uh, so that is that is really, really, really cool. I, I, I uh, last year, last January, uh, uh, Sean, Carol, my wife and I uh, joined you in a uh, uh, it was a it was a large group class about prayer and fasting. And it was fascinating. And I am going to share my screen. I think I figured out how to make this work now because I want to show the resource. Uh, and um, here you go. It was this book here, Prayer and Fasting, is a group study. And it I, that grows out of uh, the, the book Prayer and Fasting uh, by David Rocup and Michael uh, Eagle, uh, Michael Eagle. And this was the book that you walked, I, I don't know, 150 people through in a large room around tables, uh, tables. And they didn't realize when they were coming, uh, but your motivation, it was brilliant. You said, we're going to kick off small groups here in a few weeks, and we'd love for you. You're already in a small group. We'd love for you to jump in. And I just thought that was, man, that was brilliant. That was brilliant. And uh, so uh, that that really, really is powerful. Now, let, let's go from your area of ministry to the overall church. Uh, how is prayer and fasting, starting the year with prayer and fasting, how has it changed the spiritual climate at your church? Sean, gonna, I'll let you... Yeah, I, I just came from a movie and I, uh, last week. My wife and I went to uh, the, the seven churches of uh, Revelations. And there was a point made there that I, I think really spelled out um, the Western church. And, and we were, you know, it was in the uh, uh, second, uh, second chapter of Revelations, verse one. It was the church of Ephesus. And if it was a model church, I, matter of fact, I believe if we took that church, what it was doing right before God uh, and placed it in the Western church today, we would worship it. We would think it is the ideal Christian church. And yet Jesus said this I have against you. You have lost your first love. And in that, it always, you know, I've always wondered what, what that first love was. I kind of thought I did, but they, they had some theologians on afterwards talking about that. And I think this one guy just hit it on the head and he was saying, losing the love of God, the first love is when a church starts talking about Jesus, but stops talking to Jesus. Mm -hmm. Wow. And that is so powerful and so true. We can never stop talking to Jesus as individuals, as a community, as a church. We must talk to him and bring all things before him for his power. And, and it just hit me that I could see that's why we would lose our first love. We start talking about him without talking to him. And I think that that's it right in the bullseye to me. <laughs> yeah, I, I. Oh, wow. That that is really, really strong. Uh, I know uh, both of uh, uh, y'all's lead pastors uh, consider both of those guys, uh, Brandon, uh, their chapel uh, and James at at uh, at Journey. I, I consider them both friends and. And I've shared with uh, with James. I said, "Man, uh, you're preaching." I've always thought he was one of uh, the top uh, five or six uh, uh, preachers we had in Christian church in our region. But I told him, I said, "Man, you have gone to a whole new level." And I said, "That's not just 
what God's doing inside of you. But I said, I discovered it back when I was in, in his role. I told him that when I had my church on their knees, man, it got a whole lot easier to preach, you know, yeah. <laughs> it got so much easier to preach, uh, you know, and it's got to be so much easier to preach to people that didn't know Jesus in the crowd, you know, because uh, a neighbor down the road from them, uh, you know, they they were praying for uh, the lost people here today. Would they just have open ears? And uh, so man, it impacts uh, just every area. Uh, uh, Ryan, you jump in there, uh, continue the discussion. How How is this impacting the spiritual climate uh, there at chapel? You know, when you... When you walk into a place where people pray, it just feels different. <laughs> it, you know, it's like you can't you can't really put your finger on it, but it it there's something about that, you know. And when you walk into a place where where people have been praying for, you know, hundreds of years, you know, when you walk into a, a church where that has a, a that dedication of prayer, there's just something in the atmosphere. There's something there, and I feel like. You know, doing these 21 days, we actually do two sets of 21 days of prayer. Um, and in that, in doing two sets of 21 days of prayer, it, it just keeps that momentum. It keeps that atmosphere um, sweet and um, joy-filled. Um, last year, uh, during 21 days of prayer, you know, as a church staff, you know, people will, will email in, hey, I need to talk to somebody or they'll call the church. I need to talk to somebody. And and so they they sent me this one guy um, and and um, he was in a tough situation. And I said, hey, why don't you join me for prayer tomorrow? We're going to pray at our church at 7 a.m. tomorrow. Why don't you come and join me? I think I think you would really love it. And. This young guy in his in his twenties showed up at church at seven a.m. and sat next to me for prayer. And at the end of prayer, he turned to me and he looked and he he said, "There's just something different happening here. I've never been in a place like this. I've never experienced anything like this before." And and it's that that presence of God. Uh, Pastor Brandon always talks that we're a presence driven church. You know, there's that there's that that um, John Wimber, the founder of the Vineyard Church movement, he uh, he, was, he called it the radical middle. It's that place between uh, dead fundamentalism and wild experientialism. There's that radical middle where you can experience God's presence in a real and powerful way, but built on the age-old tested truths of the Word of God. And in that place, in that in that that radical middle, as John Wimber called it, is that place where that only comes by prayer, <laughs> only comes by God's people uh, spending time with the Lord so that uh, that that atmosphere is there. And and then on Sundays, it's just it's it's there because we did the work, <laughs> you know, because we spent the time with them. Uh, and, and he shows up week after week, you know, people's lives being transformed and changed. Um, and, and then it's, it's the flywheel principle. Once it gets rolling, you know, I don't, I don't think we, if we stood up and said, Hey, we're not going to pray this year in August. I think, I think people would rebel. I think they'd be like, we're going to pray anyway. In fact, uh, this last 21 days of prayer, we had, um, a, a Virginia snowstorm, which is, you know, a 10th of an inch in the whole place shuts down. And so pastor Brandon said, Hey, we're going to pray from home, from home today. And a hundred people showed up at the church. They said, "No, we're praying," <laughs> you know, and um, yeah. and it, it just changes. It does change. You, uh, let me get the phrase right again. You, you said the radical middle. Is that what you call the it? The radical middle. Yeah. Radical between middle. between dead fundamentalism and wild experientialism. I, I love. <laughs> I love that concept. Uh, the Celtic Christians, who I love, if y'all have never read anything about them, they, they were some crazy, crazy followers of Jesus. Uh, and uh, I, I, I only want to say one thing. I talked a long time about them, but they were crazy. They just wanted lost people to come to know Jesus. And uh, But what they said about prayer, they said frequent prayer in the same place uh, 
develops a thin space between heaven and earth. That's that radical middle, that thin yes. space. And I, I said I evaluate churches all the time. Uh, and it, I, I can check the boxes on do I feel welcome here today? Yep. In the parking lot, good music, da da da, good 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 coffee, you know. And I can go to good children's area. I can check all those boxes, but when it comes down to, do I get a sense that the Lord feels welcome here today? I got to tell you, Ryan, Ryan, you're right on target when you just said, when you walk into that place, you know, you just you just know, and uh, that's what I see all the time. I and when I see that. It's always because uh, there's unity in that church. There's not fussing, fighting, squabbling, uh, pushback on vision. Uh, there's none of that. And also the people are just, man, they they are rubbing their knees uh, on the floor in, in prayer. And that is a, that's a, a powerful, powerful thing. When I was preaching uh, at local church and, and uh, we uh, uh, used to pray on Wednesday night, uh, oh, oh, literally we would get meet and gather uh, and pray over the seats uh, in the auditorium. And people would go to the nursery in the children's area and lay hands on the seats. And the, the prayers were, sometimes they pray out loud, sometimes in, silent, uh, in silence. Uh, but th th their prayer was just simply God, would you cause the person that sits in this chair to know that you are here, to know that you are present, meet them in this place. And, uh, you know, the prayers weren't, would you help Neil not mess up in a sermon to, today? You know, they probably said, <laughs> that, you know, but uh, anyway, but would you meet, meet here? And then when we closed out our prayer time, every, every single Wednesday night, we'd meet out uh, at the front door, uh, out in the parking lot, uh, by the parking lot, and we pray two prayers. God, one, would you draw people here on Sunday or to another church in our area where the gospel will be plainly preached? And then number two, as they drive on this parking lot, before they ever shut down their car, would you call the, cause them to get a sense that you're here? And that's what we're talking about. And that is so, uh, uh, so, so strong. So, uh, uh, I have, I, I had shared a moment ago, uh, some resources, uh, about, uh, developing, uh, a good, uh, a good prayer ministry. Let me go back over here and, uh, share my screen. And, uh, once again, and I want to give you one other option. These two books, I, I would buy both of them. They are both simple reads and they're short reads. Uh, Dave Rokup, a, a friend of mine, uh, is a writer here. And it is just excellent stuff. And it's designed not for the theologian. It's designed for just the lay person. So somebody that you're wanting to help understand what really is prayer? What really is fasting? This is a great way to go. And then this group study is fantastic. Both of them you can find at renew.org, renew.org. And their resource uh, drop down, uh, you can find both of those uh, books listed and a whole bunch of other things. And one other resource I want to give, uh, and this kind of self-promotion, I apologize for that, but I do embrace prayer summits uh, where I come uh, to churches on Saturday morning and, and spend about a three-hour block uh, with several teaching blocks and then some very practical hands-on this is how you pray. Uh, and specifically what we're doing, we're praying on how to invite the Lord to your church. I'm all about praying for sick people. I'm all about praying for, you know, all kind, all kinds of needs. We should. Uh, but this is focused on how to invite the Lord to your place. And so if you'd be interested uh, and find out more about that for our uh, listeners tonight, my email there is at the bottom, nwheeler at waypointchurchpartners.com. And I'd love to talk to you about uh, what that might mean at, at your place. Well, we're getting close to the end here. And I'm just curious, uh, guys, I want to give you one last pop. Uh, uh, I, I, and, and the question is, what advice would you offer leaders who are considering starting a 21-day period of prayer and or prayer and fasting? Uh, and flip the coin. Ryan, you can go first. All right. All right. Well, I, first of all, start where you are. 
you know, you don't have to do what we're doing now. We didn't start where we're at right now. We started with with uh, Pastor Brandon and our worship leader, uh, acoustic guitar, a couple of candles, and you know, some of those communion packet things, and you know, six people, and um, you know, and we just started where we were, and it it builds over time. But the the principle is is the principle of you know when you're when you're chopping a tree you got to keep chopping in the same spot. You know, if you keep chopping in all different areas and try to increase the spiritual growth of your church, listen, prayer is the thing. (laughs) What did Spurgeon say? Spurgeon said, uh, prayer is the work of ministry. You know, prayer is the thing, you know, and you're not going to, we're not going to increase the spiritual level of our church without prayer. So this is a good spot to chop on. You know, and if you just consistently chop in the same spot, you know, what did what did Peterson call it? A long obedience in the same direction, you know, and just keep chopping on the same spot. And eventually, you know, you'll catch that momentum. And but you've got to model it. You've got to do it. You've got to be there um, and and show the way. The second thing is, is utilize other churches. Um, if you're not ready to do 21 days of prayer, if you don't have the team, don't have the resources, don't have the time, utilize other churches. Um, there's tons of churches doing this. You know, we're not the only game. <laughs> we're not the only people doing this. Uh, but you could you could just watch our videos. Uh, we live stream on Facebook. We live stream on YouTube. Um, if if uh, Church of the Highlands is doing it in Alabama. Um, and if you tell them that you're watching, they'll even give you a shout out one day. Uh, they, they love that stuff. Um, so utilize technology, record a devotion, you know, and just upload it, you know, once a day for, for 21 days for your people. And, um, and um, that was it. Those, those were my, those were my big things. Um, the- yeah, you can. <laughs> those are strong. Uh, those are so good, so good. Sean, how about you? Give you a, give you time. What what would your advice be? How to start? Well, I uh, um, I would first just remember. First of all, I would say everything Ryan said <laughs> is dead on. So uh, great words, Ryan. Um, but I I would say this as a reminder how powerful prayer is. You know, it was a time when. Um, there was the Holy of Holies when only one man could stand in the Holy of Holies and speak to God, the father. And today through Jesus Christ, we have a right to go to the father through his blood and be in the presence of God, just like the Holy of Holies. And that opportunity, and I don't know if we even understand the magnitude of what God has given us through Christ to be able to speak to him in this way, in this with great humility before him and go to him. He said, if you'll ask, it'll be given. So no matter what, ask God, ask him even about prayer, um, how to pray, where I can find prayer. He hears that. And I just remind us that prayer is our, our, he's given us a right that many, many people on this earth did not have to go before the father and speak to him. Uh, amazing, amazing thing. Ooh. Well, guys, I, I want to say That's thanks. Good. Thanks for uh, spending this evening with us and uh, encouraging some church leaders tonight and in the future as guys and and uh, ladies will be watching on the YouTube channel. Uh, and uh, as you're doing that, if you have a uh, uh, a question, uh, shoot it back to me. Again, it's uh, I'm Neil Wheeler, and it's in Wheeler at waypointchurchpartners.com. And I would, I, if if I don't know an answer, a lot of times I do not know an answer. Uh, I, I won't make one up. I'll find an answer for you. But I, I just want to close out with this uh, this last idea. Man, for the, for the last 30 plus years, the American church has done everything we can to try to attract people to our place. I know that because I was one of those pastors that, did everything I could to try to get people to come. The crazy thing is, though, that the American church is is realizing that the harder we try to attract people, the more people are staying away. In the New Testament, we find a totally different story. In the book of Acts chapter 1, 
book of Acts chapter four, the church prayed and God showed up on the day of Pentecost and a, a rushing violent wind. And he launched the church through a group of knuckleheaded apostles mm -hmm. and 3000 people got saved and baptized that day. Uh, in Acts chapter four, uh, two of those guys, Peter and uh, John were thrown in jail. And when they were released, they go back to the church to have a prayer meeting. And what does the church pray for? Not what most of our churches would be praying for. God, protect us. Don't let the bad people attack us here. That's not what they prayed. They prayed, God, give us boldness. And the Bible said that uh, a roaring wind, and I'm sorry, that, a, uh, uh, that the meeting house shook and people preach the word with boldness, not just the preachers, but everyone mm -hmm. spoke the word with boldness. And I tell you, boys, I, I, I believe that our God has not changed. Mm -hmm. And I believe that uh, the American church is in desperate need of uh, some roaring windstorms and some house shaking by uh, his presence. And uh, it is his presence that draws people to the foot of the cross. Well, Folks, thanks for being on with us tonight for this webinar. Uh, we just pray that you found some encouragement, perhaps a, a thought or two that you can put into practice in your own in your own place. Uh, again, write to me. I'd love to hear what you've uh, learned from tonight, what you're uh, putting into practice in your place. And uh, just have a great rest of the week as you're preparing for Easter season coming up just right around the corner. You're going to have people in your door that you won't see any other time during the year. Uh, and so pray that God would just meet them and that your place would be a place that they would be welcomed and that they would sense the welcome presence of uh, the Lord God Almighty as well. God bless you and good night.